The same day that an angry mob stormed the United States Capitol, election results were coming in from two US Senate races in Georgia, both with historic results. In a tight race, two incumbents were beat by two challengers. One, the first Jewish Senator from the state, a child of immigrants. The other, the first African American Senator from Georgia, born the 11th of 12 children raised by parents in a public housing project. Calling himself a proud American and son of Georgia, the latter candidate in his acceptance speech paid a touching tribute to his mother. The 82 year old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. He had followed in her and his father's footsteps and entered the ministry. In addition to being the now Senator from Georgia, the Reverend Raphael Warnock is the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the Atlanta congregation served decades ago by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As he has made plain, Reverend Warnock will not be surrendering his pulpit there. Rather, it seems that at least part of that pulpit will, will go with him to Washington, D.C. At this moment in history, Washington has a choice to make. In fact, all of us have a choice to make as well. Will we continue to divide, distract, and dishonor one another, Reverend Warnock asked in his speech? Or will we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Will we play political games while real people suffer? Or will we win righteous fights together, standing shoulder to shoulder for the good of our country? Repeatedly in interviews with the press, Reverend Warnock has insisted that he does not consider himself a politician, but rather a public servant. While he ran as a Democrat, he understands his constituency is at least bipartisan. In a campaign video, Reverend Warnock said, somebody asked why a pastor thinks he should serve in the Senate. Well, I committed my whole life to service and helping people realize their highest potential. I've always thought my impact doesn't stop at the church door. Given how inspiring his victory has been for people all across this country, it seems that the impact will be far reaching indeed. As Reverend Warnock told one journalist, his election alongside incoming Senator John Ossoff proved that the classic old school Southern strategy no longer worked. The Southern strategy won elections through the politics of division, through using scare tactics and demonizing the opposition. When the two newest senators from Georgia appeared together on their campaign trail, they would call each other brother, something that would have been formerly unthinkable in their once segregated state. The state that the late representative John Lewis and Dr. King called home should be proud. It struck me as such an intense national shame that the great triumph of that moment was overshadowed by that failed insurrection attempt on January 6th. One of the most chilling visuals from that day was a snapshot of a rioter inside the Capitol with a Confederate flag proudly unfurled. Remember, our union survived because the Confederacy was defeated. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, be not be lived again, the poet Maya Angelou famously proclaimed in her 1993 inaugural poem, delivered from the Capitol steps. So I believe it's all the more important for us to take a moment now to register and celebrate the tremendous significance of that special election earlier this month. Many of you have been active in recent months, mobilizing voters in Georgia, volunteering either through UU The Vote initiatives or by supporting voter outreach efforts co-sponsored by our advocacy and witness task force. Thank you for everything you did. You made phone calls, sent text messages, mailed postcards. You worked tirelessly to see that the citizens would make fullest use of the franchise in that Georgia election. Conscious that for so many years, 
so many of its citizens had time and time again been disenfranchised, especially in minority communities. The civil rights movement championed by Dr. King and others won overdue access to polling places for African Americans and the latest drives to get out the vote in his home state were a long continuation of Dr. King's work. In the last book he published in his lifetime, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Dr. King wrote, Where do we go from here? First, we must massively assert our dignity and worth. We must stand up amidst a system that still oppresses and develop an unassailable and majestic sense of values. What Americans witnessed on January 6th was very obviously a descent into chaos and an assault on community standards and norms. It actually seemed a protest against human dignity and worth as they are enshrined in our American democratic process. Sadly, this is where we are now. So where will we go from here? Do we have an unassailable and majestic sense of values that we can claim? Because that is showing itself to be absolutely necessary during these difficult days. Late in 2020, the Harvard Divinity Bulletin published an article by Reverend Warnock titled, Let My People Go. The author is not an alumnus of Harvard Divinity School, but rather my alma mater, Union Theological Seminary, where he earned both his Master's of Degree and Master's of Divinity degree and doctorate in theology. The two of us were classmates there in the aughts. A student of Black liberation theology, Reverend Warnock appreciates just how central the Exodus story from the Hebrew scriptures is to the African American experience. Those who have been held in bondage for generations over centuries in this country understand that freedom is far more elusive than it seems, especially in a place heralded as the land of the free. Reverend Warnock observes, it is oppression itself that makes necessary movements to affirm what ought to be obvious. And likewise, it is privilege itself that renders one blind to what ought to be obvious. Justice demands the recognition that all lives are not imperiled in the same ways. He charged people of faith and moral courage with reforming unjust systems across our country. Since 2017, U. Wellesley Hills has held a monthly Black Lives Matter vigil, witnessing to the need for greater justice, racial justice in America. In June 2000, just last year, we passed a congregational resolution affirming our collective commitment to anti-racist enterprises. We proclaim that Black Lives Matter because for far too long, Americans have behaved as though they did not, and certainly not in measure equal to white lives. Similarly, we declare that Black votes must count in each and every election in this country because for far too long, they have been discounted. The travesty at our nation's capital on January 6th was an especially egregious instance of a public attempt, a shameless attempt to discount them. We should all note with relief and perhaps thanksgiving that the attempt was thwarted within a day. In his campaign appearances, Reverend Warnock often engaged his audiences in a call and response that would sound familiar to those who know the cadences of the black church. He would call out to his fellow Georgians, who are we? They would answer, we the people. Who are we, he asked. We the people, they replied. Who are we, we the people? Who are we, we the people? Who are we, we the people? We the people. As Dr. King famously contended, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We the people dare not forget that today. As involved as he was in the civil rights movement, Dr. King took care to be back in the pulpit at Ebenezer Baptist Church to preach a couple of times a month, specifically on the first and third Sundays. It was there not too long before his assassination in Memphis that he preached 
perhaps his most famous sermon, the one called The Drum Major Instinct. In it, he said, if any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. As the co-pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, Dr. King advocated precisely that kind of justice, which finds the height of its power in correcting everything that stands against love, love between and among us, all of us, including we, the people. None of us need worship Dr. King as a saint, but I do think it's fair to say he is the closest thing we have to a truly American saint. Someone who listened to our lofty rhetoric and heard actual promises. He was a great patriot. He heard the promises that we had made throughout our long history and called on us to try and make good on them at long last, whatever the cost. He saw political, social, legal, and economic challenges as fundamentally spiritual problems. The language he shaped for the motto of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was patently religious, to redeem the soul of America. To redeem the soul of America. Ending segregation, criminalizing lynching, securing voting rights for African Americans. These were ways citizens everywhere might start to redeem the soul of America. Later this week, we will inaugurate a new president and swear into the office of vice president, a black woman who will preside over the US Senate, where Reverend Warnock will represent the people of Georgia, his people, and for that matter, our people too. We see certain markers of progress and we finally catch glimpses of some promises being fulfilled. These markers are significant. More so, they are inspiring. But every January, as MLK Day draws near, I am reminded again that Dr. King's chief ambition had to do with redeeming the very soul of our nation. However effective he was as an activist and advocate for racial justice in America, Dr. King never stopped being a pastor in the lofty tradition of the Black church. He never stopped being a faithful servant of the God he loved, the God who counted each among us as beloved, equal in dignity, always worthy and pleasing in God's sight. The Christian tradition frames this as a bedrock belief that we are all children of God, whatever else we might be, the child of immigrants, for example, or a sharecropper or a single mother, maybe the last born or maybe the firstborn. Regardless, we are kin to one another, sisters, brothers, siblings, family. Addressing the good people of Georgia after his historic victory, Reverend Warnock told them, together we can do the necessary work and we can win the future for all of our children. Winning that future includes guaranteeing citizens a living wage, securing them health care, enacting necessary legal reforms, advancing racial justice, and of course, delivering vaccines. Like Dr. King before him at Ebenezer, Reverend Warnock preaches the so-called social gospel. For that reason alone, I hope his seat in the Senate chamber can become an extension of the Ebenezer pulpit. These days, the soul of America needs all the pastoring it can get. According to media accounts, Georgians on his campaign stop would greet the senatorial candidate with shouts of, come on, Rev. Come on, give us the truth and speak a word of hope, both. In the days leading up to the special election, I was happily part of an online alumni group of Union Theological Seminary that started a prayer chain for Reverend Warnock. Not so much because I believe in divine intervention in democratically held elections, but because I understand that people in the public eye and the political arena need fervent prayer on their behalf. They should have that. I wonder if Reverend Warnock won't be routinely returning to Ebenezer Baptist Church as its prayer primary as its pastor primarily 
for its prayers. Our best prayers articulate and reinforce what Dr. King characterized as an unassailable and majestic sense of values. Why shouldn't we say them wherever and whenever we can? One account in the Washington Post said that Reverend Warnock's campaign for the Georgia Senate seat was a battle for the moral high ground cannot help conflating that high ground with the promised land that Dr. King, pastor and prophet in equal measure envisioned, where one would be judged by the content of our character instead of the color of our skin. If we move in a clearly moral direction, we all win. Last week, the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association issued a call for greater accountability in Washington in that she spoke for our collective conscience. But this is a call toward a new and better ethic as much as it is a call away from cynical and unconscionable strong arm tactics. It is a rallying cry for decency and unity and love of country and everyone in this country that we claim to love. Without such a vision, the people perish. In the address he gave after his historic victory in the Georgia election, Reverend Warnock concluded, the improbable journey that led me to this place in this historic moment in America could only happen here. The fifth senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Dr. King served and his father did and his grandfather before him said, God bless these United States of America. The blessing and the promise lie in our sincere and heartfelt unity as a people and nothing less. We can always choose community over chaos. I believe we have a strong sense of where we need to go from here and of the social progress still to be made. So I echo my old classmate, Reverend Warnock's sentiments. God bless these United States of America. The soul of our nation is worth saving. I hope and pray that its manifold public servants and diverse citizens can agree on that much. You hope and pray too, because together we just might be the answer to our prayers. <laughs>